Thanks for tuning in to the 168 Podcast, a podcast from Mitchell Knight and Jordan Bird of the Clarence Church of Christ, aimed at helping you connect Sunday worship with everyday life. Welcome back to the 168 Podcast. I am Jordan. This is Mitch, and I can't do it because we already messed it up the first time. But yes, I'm Jordan. This is Mitch. This is the 168 Podcast. And You or someone else have probably made the statement before of something along the line of, I've invited Jesus into my life. But is that the whole story? That's what we're going to talk about in this episode of the podcast. So Mitch, you're the one who brought this topic up. Why don't you get us started on just kind of where this topic came from for you? And um, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. uh, because The inspiration for this topic kind of came from me feeling like God's spirit was moving in me to start an online blog and just to write some of my thoughts down on, you know, the scriptures and some spiritual truths. And this is the first thing I was thinking about um, recently for that uh, avenue or that um, outlet for that kind of information. And it's just, you know, Jordan asks, is there more to the story than that? And I would say that that's not the story at all. I mean, you look at the Bible, there is nothing in the Bible that says that we pray Jesus into our heart or he enters into our heart. And the reason that this is so important to me is because not only is it not in the Bible, but what the Bible talks about is actually kind of the opposite orientation that we take. And here's what I mean by this. Instead of us calling Jesus to live inside us, it's actually us that enter in to Jesus by self-denial, by death, and through baptism. And so the inspiration from this comes from Galatians 3, 26 through 27, because it says, For all of you who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ and become heirs of the promise, referring to Abraham. We put on Christ. Some uh, translations actually say that. We are in Christ. We are in his righteousness. Uh, We're clothed by him. It's actually us entering into his reality that changes our lives. Uh, When we receive the spirit that actually enters into, you know, our hearts or our temple or our body to dwell with us, we have to deny ourselves daily. um, And we literally have to die with him at the waters of baptism Um, to be clothed in his righteousness. And there's so much of this throughout the scriptures as well, uh, especially the Old Testament about God is with you when you are with him. Uh, James mentioned something similar in four, uh, in the fourth chapter, where it's like um, basically along the same, same lines. I don't have that verse memorized, but it's like, you know, if you seek to be closer to God, he's going to seek to be closer to you kind of, or he will be closer to you. If you seek him, he'll seek you. You'll get closer to each other. So um, the orientation is not adding Jesus on to a part of our life. It's actually completely dying to our old life and entering into his life, death, and resurrection, not just at the conversion, but also through our daily lifestyle in living and serving him. So I think I went over that pretty comprehensively and hopefully understandably, but yeah, those are just some of my opening thoughts on that, and uh, Jordan can add on to that, and yeah. So one thing I hear you describing, and there's probably different facets we could look at this, but one facet that I hear you describing is to use the language of inviting Jesus into my life, but that that comes with an assumption that I am more of a central figure in life itself, and Jesus is a like tangential or a, like secondary, like add on, maybe if you will, like I'm in the center and Jesus is added on to my life. That's one thing I somewhat hear you saying and, and that language and how that's not correct. Because if we look at the whole of scripture and the whole of what we know of the life of God, it's, we are not the center. God is the center and we are brought into his story, if anything, because we are not here if God does not create us. So like we are always secondary, if you will. Would you say that's a a correct way of uh, taking in what you're saying? Right. That's, um, that's one of the main concerns. Um, like in the term, in terms of like the mental orientation of everything, it's not just the, you know, he came into my life and changed it. I actually lost my life and saved it in him as kind of the, the scriptural element of it. 
the doctrinal element of it, like I think a lot of people think that, you know, they're saved when they, you know, pray something or something like that. And a lot of that comes from John 3.16, which everyone knows, but it talks about belief. And a lot of people don't really understand what happens in 17 through 21, I believe, in that same chapter, John, 7, John 3, 17 through 21, which talks about actually living your life in a way that's consistent with the self-denial that Jesus has called you into. You have to hate what is evil, love what is good, and what is whatever is of the flesh is evil. You have to deny that part of yourself, and you have to seek um, Christ and his desires. Um, John's letters mention that as well. It says that... Um, You know, whoever is born of God um, lives as Jesus did. It's a completely different lifestyle. It isn't just believe. Uh, Jesus' brother, James, mentions that in his letter. He says, you know, even the demons believe that there's one God, and they shudder. But, like, what about you? I mean, how are you different? I mean, faith, faithfulness, and that kind of lifestyle is completely different from the whole pray Jesus into your heart thing. And... I think I got a different foundation on that because of my experience going to a recovery church in Fredonia where people were really um, intent on following the scriptures like Luke 9 and Luke 14 about denying yourself every day, picking up your cross and following after you. Um, They weren't trying to invite Jesus, you know, into their alcoholism. They were trying to forsake their alcoholism and find life in Jesus. It's the opposite kind of orientation. And that's, I think, why I'm so passionate about that. Because when we think about things that way, and we actually live our lives that way, it opens up a much more satisfying and fulfilling reality for us, rather than the, hey, I checked the box on the cultural list. Because a lot of that just seems, I'd have to look at the history of it, but it seems more of like an Americanized gospel message. And I think the whole John 316 thing that showed up everywhere. I think it was in the 70s or whatever. Maybe. I don't know the the exact history, but it's very much like an individualized American thing, and I just don't think that's what the Bible points us towards. I don't think there's anything like that. It's actually about self-denial rather than adding something to yourself. It's about finding a new self by giving it up. My my awareness historically of where there's something like a whether you call it the sinner's prayer or a prayer to invite Jesus into your life, that comes to popularity, whether I'm not sure if maybe it existed in some form before this, but as a practice or a habit or like kind of in the invitational way that it's maybe more used now that you hear about, my understanding is that comes more from the revival periods, which is more in the Americans, America's side of history at least more recently, so like the first and second great awakening. So you'd have, you know, these tent revivals out outside of town or whatnot, and people would be coming back to Jesus. But I think that's the distinction there. You're you're already preachers were preaching to a more or less more or less sort of religious or Christianized people already. Whether and, and the issue was that the they weren't it wasn't that they were denying faith, they just weren't living it out. And so the issue was a calling them back to faithfulness, if anything, is my understanding. And so to me, there's a distinction of calling someone to be sort of re, um, yeah, to, to recommit yourself to following Jesus in a way that you already had maybe done so before and having nothing to do with that. And this is the entry point into it. And so to me, there's a little bit of a distinction there of how it was used, but it became the typical place where, following Jesus began, whereas scripturally, as, as you and I would at least read scripture, ideally it seems that baptism is the moment that that is identified as. Not that there's not some contextual stuff that goes with that, but that's the moment that would that historically gets point, pointed to. I mean, just as you read through um, some of Paul's letters, like he even makes reference to, like, did I baptize you or this person or that person? Or remember your baptism. Like, it's a it's a point in history that's to be remembered for a reason, not just because it was this kind of add on thing to follow Jesus, but as a transitional thing. I mean, it's why it's almost, it's, it's part of every person who converts within acts. As far as I can recall, it's part of their story. It was, it was that moment where that was recognized as happening. Does that mean that's the first recollection they had of their encounter with God or all that different stuff? No, like 
some of that comes on both sides of of that moment but that's the the moment that at least seems to historically be identified with that that conversion point but historically that's where i my understanding of where the the transition sort of happens of a prayer or something like that becomes the the habit and there's the thing called oh i can't remember the guy's name now i'm, I'm gonna wish kick myself for not remembering but charles finney i think is his name um he's the one i think noted for what was called the sinner's bench and that's where it was like you come forward to the altar and you confess your sins and like pray to have jesus come to your life that's i think where a lot of that kind of gets historically pinpointed back toward uh, so anyway that's i think some of the history at least as far as, as far as i understand it um would you say there's any place for within the christian walk even if it's past the moment of converting where there is a sense of inviting Jesus to be a part of your life from kind of the after conversion perspective, or how do you see that scripturally? Um, so from like the, like from like a salvation perspective, I, I don't really see it, but from like a restoration perspective, I mean, there are people that wander, um, that come back. I mean, that's definitely something that happens. I mean, repentance and that kind of lifestyle, the Luke 9, Luke 14 lifestyle, is an everyday lifestyle, and people will walk away from that. Um, but, you know, we can be restored. We can come back um, to the work that God began in, in us that we're quenching through our own evil desires. And, um, yeah, I mean, you don't, oh, oh excuse me belts a little bit. Thank you, Burger King. Um, you don't always have to go back and start at the beginning is the main point. You can go, you can immediately pick up where God was working with you when you were last interacting with him. Um, you know, I think um, there's a lot about enduring to the end. There's a lot about the daily lifestyle aspect of it. And not all of us are going to be consistent, whether that's like minor inconsistencies or major inconsistencies where you walk away from God for years. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as I can see it, uh, restoration is certainly possible. It doesn't involve rebaptism. Um, it just involves coming back home. It's the story of the prodigal son, right? I mean, um, your father is going to meet you halfway as he sees you walking down the road. I mean, so there's there's always hope to return if you've walked away. Yeah, I know one verse that's often appealed to for something like the Lord's, not the Lord's Prayer, but like uh, praying to ask God and to, you know Jesus to come into your heart is Romans 10, 9 where it talks about for is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So there's a, the form isn't there, but the, the idea is sort of there, at least in the text, but con contextually, I think this verse probably fits more with a little bit more with like what you're saying. I mean, even within the context of Romans 10, it's talking about Israelites who haven't yet, accepted jesus as savior but talking about a, a jewish person is a little bit different than a, just a someone who's has no connection to god whatsoever because right. with them with a jewish person you're talking about moving from one covenant to another but there's not a just ig ignorance or no connection to god to begin with it's more of a you are you're going down this path but i need you to come back over here at least that's kind of how i'd read it not that they were they weren't totally wrong the first way, but it's not the fullness of the way they need to be on. You need to accept Jesus to be on the fullness of the right. life that you're, you're headed toward. So something important that you're bringing up is the, the context of what's being written. And part of the literary context of that, that verse is what is said by Paul four chapters before that about, or don't you know that for those of you who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? He's talking about baptism. He's talking about this is when your relationship with God started. Four chapters later is not necessarily where you begin the letter of Romans. It's like, you know, like Mike says, it's like I'm okay with listening to that, but the preface is what's happening here. So like what you're talking about, it's more of a, more of a nuanced thing, but it's not like the, the one verse doctrine thing. I just don't think, you know, 
applies. It seems like we just look for something that we want to be true and we read it into our lives. But you have to, like you're saying, take into account who he's writing to, what was said before, um, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, one thing, you were talking about Romans 6 there just a moment ago. That That's one verse that stood out to me thinking about just this topic in general because that that whole chapter early part of the chapter talks about being united right to the death of christ and united to the resurrection of christ and so but you see there it's not a christ uniting with you it's a you uniting to christ dynamic and yeah. so the it's a the, process that involves burial yeah so there's like a getting rid of you to become the you that only you can be in christ is essentially how i would understand it but beyond that, like going back to the Romans 10, 9 uh, verse, I do think there's application of that verse from a discipleship orientation, which we've kind of already talked about in the none of us are ever going to be completely like perfect in following Jesus. So there's always a where we need to repent or turn back or ask forgiveness or be reshaped. We're always being sanctified is kind of the idea. Like we're not, we're, we haven't reached perfection, uh, in eternity yet. Like, so that's an ongoing thing for us. And so there is a place in which we do need to constantly be believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I think where that can often go sideways in, in another way is that, well, I did that a long time ago. As if, like, you don't need to confess Jesus as Lord and believe yeah. that each and every day, each Affirm and every his moment. Lordship. Yeah, belief isn't just a one time thing. It's an ongoing process that involves influence of your lifestyle. Yeah, so there's a, there's a shaping and molding in which our life needs to constantly be formed to Jesus as Lord. Um, I'm trying to think, of, like, in my head, like, I mean, being formed to, like, when you think of anything being molded to something, like, it needs to. Like, if you ever tried to mold something to an object, like, you have to constantly be shaping and moving the material to get all the way around or in that mold so that it's fully formed to it. And we often will, like, we slide out of the mold or whatever it may be, like, in, in a very, like, concrete way in our life. And so we constantly have to be going back to or be regrounded in, like, Jesus is Lord, I am not. That's what I need to live out in my everyday interaction it's also what needs to be true with within my you know the internal part of my life if you will that my heart but the whole idea there is that that's holistic within my life not just that i can say that but i don't actually live that way so to me that verse does have application in a very like prayerful you know demeanor toward god but it's an ongoing prayerful demeanor with God where we're constantly having to be, Oh yeah, I failed at having you be Lord of my life in this way. I need to remember that you are and to live into that. And so that's an ongoing thing. Not just that I did that back whenever I came to, you know, for, where Jesus became my Lord the first time. Um, because so, so yeah, my, my whole point is that I don't think it, that that verse has to be totally just taken away from this whole discussion. I just think it's, it's not the beginning. It's the ongoing part of, of the journey is, right. is how I would understand it. Whereas it's become in more recent Christian history, it's often become the starting point, And that's the only place it's ever applied. Whereas I think it has more of an ongoing application process in how we understand it holistically throughout scripture. Is there anything more with, with this topic that, that stands out to you that you want to highlight that's maybe come to mind? Uh, no, I would just wrap up by saying that all of this, um, is kind of indirectly saying that, you know, baptism is the point of our salvation. It's where our sins are forgiven. We're filled with God's spirit. We are raised to a new life in Christ through our faith. If that is not something that you have done, um, I would encourage you to reach out, you know, to Jordan, me, Mike, our elders, or anybody that you trust, a Christian, um, to help you through that process of fully obeying God's word and his call for you into his kingdom. So, All right. Thanks for giving your thoughts about this topic and bringing it up. And thank you all for joining us, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody.